Hi, I'm Imogen Hermes Gower and I'm the author of The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock. The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock is set in London in 1785, where a merchant, Jonah Hancock, is waiting in Deptford for his ship to return. Unfortunately, it never does, but what he gets instead is this tiny, wizened, mummified mermaid, which looks a lot like a monkey stitched to a fish's tail. Across town in Soho, the highly desirable courtesan Angelica Neal finds herself down on her luck and in need of a new keeper to pay her bills. Jonah and Angelica are sucked into the orbit of this mermaid and set out together to climb the Georgian social ladder. We're in Dr Johnson's house just behind Fleet Street, which I first visited when I was a student and was immediately struck by its really peaceful atmosphere. I love how sparsely it's furnished, but also it's really intelligently and thoughtfully curated with a lot of love. It's very easy to imagine it being Johnson's home and existing in the period that he lived. I always really loved this place and after I sold the book I felt that I really needed something to continue to anchor me to the 18th century and to keep me thinking about it and have it fresh in my mind. So when I saw that Dr Johnson's house needed volunteers I applied. I actually went over the copy edits for The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock on the top floor of this building in the garret where Johnson wrote his dictionary. I have a really great affection for Dr Johnson and it's only grown since I've been here. You get such a sense of his character and you can really imagine him inhabiting these rooms. I got the idea for The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock when I was working at the British Museum and there I just started writing again as an adult and I used to try and challenge myself to write short pieces of fiction inspired by the artefacts that I worked around. So if I was in a gallery I would choose something and I would try and imagine the context that it might have originally been in and the people who could have been around it and make a story from it. One of those objects was a real mermaid, which is in the British Museum collection. It's usually tucked away in quite a dark corner and not many people know about it. So it was always quite fun sending children to see it because it's really scary. And it's very similar to the one in the book, so it's kind of baby-sized with these sharp little monkey teeth and its fists kind of pulled up. And when I looked at it, I thought, a collector in the 18th century who wanted a mermaid for his Wunderkammer would expect to receive something like this. And what would happen if instead he got a real nebulous, powerful mermaid come back instead? And that was where the idea first came from. And I immediately had the characters of Mr. Hancock and Angelica Neal in my head, like they were kind of fully formed and I could hear the voice of the novel very clearly from the beginning. So it worked because I'd always been really interested in the 1780s and the women of that period. So it was really easy to bring my love of the period into this story and to create a world that felt to me really convincing and powerful. The British Museum Mermaid does probably date from the 18th century. During this period in Japan, they were making these representations of Ninyo, which are kind of water spirits, which the Dutch would then mistake for real mermaids, whereas in fact they were usually made from monkeys stitched onto a fish's tail. These curiosities would then be transported back to Europe and exhibited in great cities with huge excitement. When I'd written about 20,000 words of what became The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock and I realised that I was kind of onto a good thing, I put it aside completely and I just researched for about 10 months. So for me, that meant every day that I wasn't working in a cafe, which was my job at the time, I would go into the British Library, into rare books and music, and I would get out everything and read and make notes for hours and hours every day. I read a lot of current academia, but my focus was often on contemporary texts like 18th century novels and pamphlets. Um, my original focus was on something called Harris's List, which the British Library owned several volumes of. This was a kind of time out of sex workers in Georgian London, so it would have a little review and maybe this woman's price and her address and her history sometimes, which was a really interesting insight into Georgian women and also how sex workers were viewed by the people who used them. I also thought it was really important to experience as much of Georgian life as I could physically, so quite often I would cook things out of contemporary recipe books. I made myself a robe a la Ren, which is the kind of fine muslin dresses that you see in lots of 1780s portraits. Um, and I also tried to walk everywhere, so I explored 
all the places in my book on foot, looking around really trying to pick up things that still existed from the period, the footprints of streets, the way that the light falls on them. I really wanted to feel how my characters might have felt in navigating London and thinking about it as an 18th century city from the ground. I'd been really interested in Georgian London long before I ever thought to write fiction about it, so I would always read biographies of women from the period who I really admired. People like Emma Hamilton and the actress Dora Jordan, who has mostly been forgotten to history now, but who was super famous and extraordinary in her day. So I already loved the period and really felt comfortable with it. I think it's really stylish and beautiful. The sense of humour also really appeals to me. And when I was researching, I think I would, I would laugh most days. Um, there's also, I think, in late 18th century London, a real sense of excitement and social movement and also scientific interest. It feels like a very forward-looking intellectual period. But it was, it was the women who really drew me in and whose characters I found so appealing and compulsive. I think I wanted to interrogate the mermaid myth. As a child, one of the big Disney movies was um, The Little Mermaid, which I found really compelling, but it's very pretty and sanitised. But what attracted me as a little girl to the mermaid myth was this idea of the hugeness of the sea and these quite powerful, mysterious females that were in it. For me, it was all about that kind of power and strength that I felt I saw and um, independence. And I feel that the traditional mermaid myth has a lot more of this darkness and danger in it and I wanted to revisit that. I think it's too easy to portray mermaids as being kind of sexy and beautiful when actually they are a lot more and they would have been historically regarded as huge fear. I think it really reflected the way that people inhabited the world then this real well-founded fear that if you went to sea you weren't going to come back and that I think people lived with a much larger sense of loss and fear then than they did now, which partially manifests in this myth of dangerous, powerful mermaids.